KSJE is supported by San Juan Regional Medical Center, your community hospital with a rich heritage that dates back to before New Mexico was a state. We've been improving the health of the Four Corners since 1910. As a nonprofit hospital, San Juan Regional Medical Center is a values driven organization. We strive to deliver on our mission to personalize health care and create vitality and enthusiasm in healing. We are here for you when you need us, offering a comprehensive range of inpatient, outpatient, and emergency care services. Eleven minutes past eight o'clock. It is Thursday morning, November the first. Good morning, everybody. I'm Scott Micklin, and thank you for tuning in to KSJE ninety point nine FM, the information and cultural beacon of the Four Corners. Special good morning to our viewers who are watching us live today on our Facebook page and the KSJE channel on YouTube. Welcome aboard, everybody, from our visual radio studio here at San Juan College. Coming up in just a moment, my guest on the program today, archaeologist Paul Reed, will be talking about uh, the new book that uh, Paul Reed has written about the area, also an article about the discovery in Texas recently. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Later on this hour, of course, as we do on Thursdays, we will talk about the economy with my guest, Jason Calcote from Citizens Trust and Investment Corporation. Also, don't forget Roving with the Arts at 9 a.m. this morning. Mick Hess will be on the radio at 90.9 FM playing Haydn Symphonies numbers 77 and 78 on Roving with the Arts today. And skipping ahead to noon, it is our local movie review program, A Review Too Far. And this week, our movie reviewers are talking about the film Goosebumps 2. You'll hear what they thought about that film today on uh, the Review Too Far at noon on KSJE. And of course, you can always check out our programs and going to our website where our program schedule is listed at ksje.com. It's also where you'll find our regional events calendar. And uh, taking a look at that calendar, you can see today there's a lecture on social justice and faith happening today here at San Juan College. The Encore Birthday Party on tap for tomorrow at the Henderson Fine Arts Center. It's also San Juan Symphony Weekend here in the area. Symphony Saturday night in Durango and Sunday afternoon here in Farmington. And on November 6th, next week, we want to remind you about the San Juan Regional Medical Center Hall of Fame induction ceremony at the San Juan College Little Theater. It's also craft fair season. We've got lots of craft fairs listed on our regional events calendar at ksje.com, so you can check it out. If you're part of a nonprofit group that's having an event, we encourage you to add your event to our calendar. Again, it's at ksje.com. Well, let me turn to my guest who is joining us from his home via Skype this morning, and it's a, apparently a snowy morning where you are, Paul Reed. Good morning. Good morning, Scott. Uh, we had a we had a nice little storm move in on Tuesday night to to drop a nice blanket of snow for Halloween. Nice. Well, it's good to good to see you via Skype this morning, and uh, thank you for being with us and to talk a little bit about uh, well this new book that that you have been uh, writing and is now published. So, congratulations. You are now author Paul Reed, in addition to uh, your many other uh, accolades. Right. Um, yeah, I think what what what's really exciting about this book is that it's it's a contributed volume. So we have about ten authors, and I'd like to give everyone who contributed a shout out, if that's okay. Yes, of course. So um, my my co editor is um, Gary Brown, longtime archaeologist at Aztec, who uh, moved to California a couple of years ago. So Gary and I uh, conceived of the idea in the summer of 2012, and then went about went about just recruiting folks who had um, interesting contributions. Um, the title of it is Aztec, Salmon, and the Pueblo and Heartland of the Middle San Juan. So, so this is really the area that's right around Farmington and, and going out a little bit north to the Colorado border, a little bit west towards Shiprock, and then south towards Chaco, but a, fa a fairly unique geographic area. So. The folks who've contributed include um, Larry Baker, who is uh, Solon Ruins Museum Executive Director, um, has been there for, for 25 years. Right. Um, Lori Stevens, who is an archaeologist at Aztec Ruins, working with ceramics. Lori Webster, who is a textile and clothing, sort of what we call a perishable material expert. Lori's up in um, Mancus, Colorado, and has done a lot of interesting work. Um, 
Kathy Roller Durand and Ethan Ortega, um, affiliated with Eastern New Mexico University, they were trying. <coughs> Excuse me. They were trying to talk about the foods that the Pueblo people in in the area ate um, in the past. Um, Florence Lister, who was a very well known archaeologist, um, with her husband Bob, Bob passed in the mid '90s. Florence lived uh, into her '90s and was closely affiliated with Crow Canyon, had a place up in um, Mancos, Colorado. Florence unfortunately passed away, but we're thrilled that her contribution is um, in our book. Um, Teresa Pasqual, who is an Acoma uh, Pueblo tribal member and a longtime archaeologist and anthropologist, wrote the closing article for our book. Um, really pulled everything together well with her perspective. Um, Mark Varian, an archaeologist up at Crow Canyon, uh, contributed a paper, an article that really tries to put our area to the south, sort of in the context of the greater Mesa Verde region to the north. So, yeah, just a just a. You know, a great group of contributors, and, and we're really pleased with how it came out. Very good. Well, congratulations to uh, the cooperative effort, it sounds like, of all of you for uh, putting that uh, putting it all together. And this is not the first book that you have written um, or been involved with, Paul Reed, that I'm familiar with, right? You've This is this is not the first one. No, no. There, there, have, been, there have been three edited volumes and then one single-authored one that I've done over the years. And But with a, with a pretty, pretty tight focus on Farmington... Um, out to Chaco and you know just really in the greater San Juan Basin and I'm I'm just pleased that I've been able to work in this this amazing archaeological area and this cultural area for 30 some years now and and you know we, we talk in archaeology about archaeology about trying to understand the past of course and and you know it's it's in some ways as we talk on this show a moving target so um, we take we take a breath as it were and get some folks together who know some things about an area and then we 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 put out a volume so and what's particularly interesting about this one in my view is it's through the school of american research um but imprinted under the unm press um logo if you will and it's in the sar press series that's designed to bring results of archaeology to the public um Right. So this is written in normal language. It doesn't have a lot of what we might call archaeo speak, and we worked pretty hard, even though we are the group is gen is almost entirely archaeologists, to write in a language that would be really accessible to folks who are just interested. So a lot of times, you know, archaeologists and other scientists and professionals write fairly data intensive, table intensive texts that are designed to convey really specific info. And in this case, we really stepped back, took off those hats, and said, you know, we're going to try and be good, popular science writers. And, you know, so I, I think we did okay. And, you know, as people get the book and read it, I, I will certainly, it'll be interesting to see if folks feel like we did a pretty good job of, of getting, you know, the information out to the public. Right. And and so with this book, Paul Reed, as you mentioned, it kind of brings together a lot of the, the work and research that's been done um, on some of the, the areas that folks would be very familiar with here, uh, um, from Selman Ruins to Aztec, and in this area that, that you refer to as the Middle San Juan, that a lot of folks refer to as the Middle San Juan. Any Anything new or surprising or any new conclusions maybe that uh, has been gleaned that is in this that is in this book from you and your collaborators well I, I think what what we were what we were going for and this this goes back to other research um, that this this group of people have done some of us together and, and others separately um, this goes back to the idea that this area is not just sort of Mesa Verde South or Chaco North um, and, you know, archaeological research has developed now, of course, over a hundred some years. And early on, um, people coming into the area, explorers, early archaeologists, anthropologists, tended to focus on the biggest, most dramatic sites. Um, those are found in a variety of places, but in our neighborhood, of course, we have Chaco and Mesa Verde. And I think what we see historically over the last 50 years is people trying to fit in sort of greater Farmington the middle San Juan into, uh, well, it, it looks like Mesa Verde, but it's a little different because it's south, or it looks like Chaco, but it's a little different, it's north. And I think what the, the folks in our volume really feel as a group is that it's its own unique area, that we, we definitely have influence from Chaco Canyon. Um, we did a research project with generous support from the National Science Foundation about 10 years ago, and we're looking specifically at the idea that people migrated from Chaco Canyon 
two first Salmon Pueblo at about 1090, and then the Aztec area and at about 1100 and after. And we felt like the hypothesis was strongly supported. So we clearly have strong Chaco and presence migration into the area. But what's interesting is that after the Chacoan period ended at 1140, we see a lot of interesting changes in these sites and in the region that reflect a local adaptation to what was going on in the world at that point. And then after 1200, we see large populations migrating in, not from Mesa Verde, really, but from areas to the west and to the east, and the sites get bigger and bigger uh, in the 1200s. So. I think sort of the bottom line new contribution and something we've been talking about for a bit is that this area really is its own interesting archaeological zone and that certainly these people interacted to the north and the south, east and west, but there really is an identity that we feel, you know, is knowable and we're beginning to understand that for this this unique area. Interesting. And so um, if I understand what you're saying is that as folks were... um maybe the, the society around the Chaco Canyon that had been so influential for such a long period of time kind of went into a decline. It was this area, at least partly, that started to see some population growth and some more, I guess, being centered around the middle San Juan area than having to get influences from other outside areas? Right, right, exactly. And I think what we see is that the sites at Salmon and Aztec, the big sites, as well as some, some smaller great houses that we see in the time period, um, were founded as Chaco was beginning to go through sort of the throes of transition and to a point where Chaco wasn't going to necessarily be that central place anymore. So Salmon gets built at 1090, Aztec at 1100, and Aztec in particular really becomes sort of the focal point for ancient Pueblo culture in the area with Lots of people, we've estimated population at Aztec by 1225, 1230, at probably 1,000 to 2,000 people, so quite a large settlement. Um, of course, sites across Greater Mesa Verde uh, were being built during this time. The cliff dwellings date from 1225 and on. Lots of population up there, and that's what people typically think of for this 1200s time period. You know, we've seen that Aztec was a really large site in its own right and traded with people at Mesa Verde, but, you know, was pretty much anchoring the Pueblo presence in this area and, again, was a very important site. Interesting. And and so with that being said, I guess uh, it's fascinating for folks to read about these these sites that are really right in our, literally in our, in our backyard. And I think for a lot of folks who live here, we sometimes forget that we live in such a rich archaeologically speaking, uh, area that has been the focus of some of this very interesting research over the last, well, 100 years or more probably, but but even more so recently, right? Right. And, you know, this is an interesting phenomenon because I've seen this about every place that I live. Um, as I've gotten to know different communities and you start talking to people, um, you know, like just take the example of Solomon Ruins, for example. You talk to people in the, in the, in the greater Farmington area and they're like, oh, yeah, I went, I went to Solomon uh, you know, on a field trip in third grade. And, and then, right. you know, if there are folks living and working in the area and they don't necessarily have that strong connection to the archaeology and the history, that may be the only visit for 30-some years. So, yeah, I think what, what, what this kind of a volume hopefully will do is to get people sort of interested again in this area. Um, because, again, we wrote this not for, you know, that group of a couple thousand archaeologists who really want to dig in, as it were. There's an archaeology joke for you, Scott. Thank you. Um, and and, uh, and kind of nerd out on the archaeology, and, and we love that as well. But um, the average person maybe just wants to pick up a, a readable book, look at a couple chapters, and get a sense of, of what the area was like between, say, 1050 and about 1250. And, you know, so hopefully, again, we, we've, done a, we've done an okay job with that. And and people will be able to pick up this book. It's it's a pretty quick read and get a sense of what was very interesting and um, magical, if you will, about these sites. Because people tour the sites, they see the large buildings, and you know they they have to be wondering. I, I've wondered since I was a kid. You know, how did these amazing buildings come to be here? So that's part of the story. Gary Brown, in particular, highlights that for Aztec. I um, speak to sort of Salmon Pueblo's development over a couple hundred years in a chapter I wrote. Um, another one of our authors, um, Wolke Toll, talks about the development of the very interesting sequence of sites that we see in the La Plata Valley. So just, you know, a little bit to the west and, you know, from an archaeological point of view, a very different settlement area. 
the La Plata Valley had people in, in good numbers, and I'm talking, you know, hundreds and low thousands from probably 550 B.C. all the way to 1250 in a little bit later. And then the Chaco phenomenon sort of came into the area at first Solomon and then Aztec, and small Chaco sites were built along the La Plata Valley. There's one at a site called the Holmes Group, which part of which was just acquired by the Archaeological Conservancy um, to preserve that site. And there's a couple other locales. So, but the rest of the La Plata Valley still looks like sort of the longtime Pueblo settlement area that it was. So, even as we talk about this area in some sort of you know homogeneous terms, there's a lot of interesting variation as well. So, hopefully, again, that's conveyed in in different articles and the focus on um, you know how people made and used pottery, how they hunted, um, how they wore clothing, and what was important is designed to get to that basic point of, you know, who, who do we think these people were, how were they making their living, and, and that, that's the part that, as archaeologists, we're, we're ultimately seeking is a better understanding of these people. Sure. And Paul Reed, as you always tell me, when, uh, when, when something is written about uh, a certain study or some research, it always is up for scrutiny, I guess. And uh, even though this is, a, I think, a well-accepted narrative of uh, the area and uh, who lived here and what they did and where they came from and, and maybe uh, at least a little bit, sorry, we know where they, where they went, um, has there been any, any questions about some of, the, some of the work, any alternate theories or alternate uh, discussions about what has been uh, written by you and your colleagues? Well, I, I think what's been interesting is, um, you know, I, I came into this research um, when I started work with Archaeology Southwest, partnering with Larry Baker at Solomon Ruins in, in, in 2001, and there was a pretty strong narrative in place at that point about what happened at Solomon Pueblo with the research of Cynthia Irwin Williams, who we, we honor in this volume, and, of course, Earl Morris's work up at Aztec, which, which dates to 100 years ago at this point. It was in the 19-teens. Right. So I think we've been trying to sort of expand that view a little. And, and, I, and I think the, the fairly simple narrative at that point was Chacoan period. Um, Chacoans migrated, left, whatever they did. And then Mesa Verdean period. And we certainly see the Chacoan influence, but we've tried with the re research we've done and try to convey in this book some of the subtleties of that, that it wasn't just, you know, what, what happened at Solomon and Aztec didn't look like everything down in Chaco Canyon. But I think the really big part of it is that we've turned the narrative of, oh, then the Mesa Verdeans came down and, and brought a lot of people to, no, this was a local development where people were making the pottery that we used to track, you know, the, the Mesa Verdean people, you know, as, as we might call them, a type called, unsurprisingly, Mesa Verde Black on White. We have early examples of this at both Salmon and Aztec, and at Aztec in particular, we might have one of the earliest versions of that style of pottery. So um, this, this is all about archaeological priority. This type was found up in Mesa Verde, and it was called Mesa Verde Black on White, which is a lovely name. The irony, I think, in some ways is it, maybe it should have been called Aztec Black on White, or who knows, some, some other name. Um, but, you know, in archaeology, again, we have historical precedents. People learn the history of the archaeology a certain way. So, yeah, we've tried to expand that and say certainly some people probably came from Mesa Verde, and we may have sent people from the Middle San Juan up. But most of what was happening in the 1200s at Solomon and Aztec, these other big community centers, was about things going on in these valleys in Farmington, in the greater Farmington area. So that, I think, is probably the thing that people who learned the archaeology and the history of the archaeology differently might scratch their heads a little and say, you know, this doesn't fit the narrative of, you know, Mesa Verde, greater Mesa Verde dominance. And the interesting thing about that is we find the type Mesa Verde black and white over a huge area of the Four Corners, all four states. We find it traded to areas almost to Albuquerque. And... You know, it was a very sought-after type, but what we found with local studies is people were making this pottery in a lot of different places. So, anyway, just, just another sort of rich, you know, thread in this overall tapestry that we're, we're trying to understand. Very much so, very much so. My guest this morning, local archaeologist Paul Reed, he is talking about his uh, book that he has written, along with some other uh, colleagues. And, uh, uh, Paul, as we look at the cover of 
the book, um, and it certainly is one of those unmistakable um, archaeological features of uh, of one of the ruins around the area. It might be Aztec, could be Salmon. You probably know exactly where it is. Um, but um, what are we seeing? It's kind of the you know a view through a couple of doorways. It looks like to me. Right. Um, one of the interesting features of um, many of the Chacoan sites is that. You know, the rooms were connected in patterns that um, we often call suites of rooms. And this particular one was shot at Aztec, looking from an interior room through several rooms and then out into the Aztec, um, the reconstructed Great Kiva at Aztec. So it is kind of a, an epic view, I think, is, a, is a, <laughs> a pretty good description of it. Right. And sort of, this, and, you know, an interesting metaphor as well for looking from the inside out, perhaps, to try to understand this, this very interesting archaeological area very true but when you think about it that view that hasn't changed for 800 years my math is it's early but a long (laughs) time a long time well very good gives us a sense of that time depth it definitely does well paul thank you so much for discussing the book um we're going to take a short break but there's another article i want to ask you a little bit about so we can do that about a new discovery i think relatively new in uh, nearby texas and see what you think about that all right sounds good All right, back with my guest with more in just a moment. Archaeologist Paul Reed will be back with more on KSJE. The time is 8.31. 